So we're going to start again with the kids' message. So if you're kids, you gotta, you got to pay attention at this time. And I want to hear from you. We got a review last week. And um, I, I, as, I, as I was doing this, I rem- was reminded of a story that I just had to bring to you. I don't know that I've ever told this story here. Um, but I was helping in children's ministry a few years ago. And I was with a particularly rambunctious third grade class. And we were sitting in the main room, the teacher was talking, this they asked, what did we talk about last week? And all the kids were silent because nobody was paying attention the week before. And she asked it again and said, what did we talk about last week? It started with an H. And I was sitting next to a, a particularly enterprising third grader. How old is third grader? Seven, eight, something like that. Yeah, just a, a, a very rambunctious little seven or eight year old. She asked, what did we talk about last week? It started with an H. And without missing a beat, he piped up, hardly anything. (laughs) So, that being said, I know the danger of asking kids, what did we talk about last week? But I will take my chances. Anybody remember, what did we talk about last week? Jesus. Jesus is a good answer, Gordon. Anybody else? I had one phrase that you were supposed to remember. Leah, you got it in your head. I can see it. (laughs) <laughs> All right, God has been faithful, is what we talked about last week. God has been faithful. We looked at the story of the Exodus, and God was with his people. He told Moses, I will be with you. And then we looked at Jesus coming, and they named him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And God has been faithful to hear our cry and to come and be with us. This morning, I have another phrase. Are you ready? I'm going to put it up on the screen. Oh, it's already, you can click one more for me, Heidi. Uh, One more again. Okay. God with us to save us. Can you guys say it? Ready? God with us to save us. Okay. So that next week when I ask you, you have to be able to say that back. Okay. Write it down. There you go. God with us to save us. Okay. If you've spent any time with other kids or any adults, if you've ever been with kids, one thing that they all hate is when something is unfair. Anybody? Yes. Okay, there you go. Anybody who's ever been with kids, you know they're going to let you know if something is unfair. I'm convinced the quickest way to teach a child to count is to give them eight goldfish crackers and the child next to them ten. And they will learn very quickly this is not fair. But we're going to try and drive that point home. I need two children volunteers. Who wants to volunteer? Can't be from the same family. Leah, Lizzie, do you want to come? Come on, Lizzie. You're sitting right next to her. Both of you, come on. I need you. Take a line. I said they can't be from the same family. Lizzie, I need your help. Come here. Okay. So we're, we are going to play a game, and it is going to be fair. Okay? This, this game has to be fair. And before we even start, I need you to know, the money that you're about to get, you don't get to keep. Okay? Yeah, there you go. I sh- I, that's not fair. There you go. It's my money. You don't get to keep it. So... We are going to play a game, and I have a $20 bill for both of you. I know, I, didn't, I, I had ones, and I thought, now this will be more interesting if I give 20s. <laughs> but we're going to play a game, and you have to play by the rules. We're going to play several different versions, and whoever wins is going to get a $20 bill. Okay? First off, it's going to be pretty easy. Rock, paper, scissors. You guys know how it goes. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Whoever wins gets a $20 bill. Ready? $20 for Lizzie. Okay, I'm fair, right? I said those were the rules. You played. I gave you the $20. Okay, give it back. You don't get to keep the money. I have to remind you every single time. Next up, you're going to get a point for everything that I say. Whoever has the most points at the end of this gets to keep, gets $20. You don't get to keep. You get $20 for the time being. Okay, so I want you to put your hands out and keep your, keep, well, you got to keep them down. Keep, keep the number of points that you have. Whoever has, oh, uh, Leah, you're going to win on this one. The most siblings. Six. Oh, five. You went, put up a point. Whoever, has, whoever is the oldest. <laughs> Lizzie's older than Leah. All right. Whoever is tallest. <laughs> Whoever's birthday is closest to today. Yours was like two weeks ago, wasn't it? Leah, put, give, me, give me another. All right. Whoever was born in Fort Wayne. Were you born in Fort Wayne? You get another point. 
Whoever has the longest hair. Me. <laughs> okay, how, how many points do you each have? Three and three. Great. We need a tiebreaker. Ah, I don't have that. I, need, I needed seven and I didn't have seven. Hmm. Who wants to come up with one? That you don't know. You got, yeah, that's not allowed. That's not allowed. Anybody got one more? We can, we can separate Malachi. Who has, the big house? Who has the biggest house? I don't think we're going to be able to measure that right now. What's that? All right. You know what? It doesn't matter. You guys both had the most points. All right. You both win. There you go. Am I fair? Yes. Am I fair? Okay. Give them back one more time. Give them back one more time. Okay. We're going to do it again, except it's going to be the opposite. You're going to start with the money. And if you don't do what is on my list, you have to give it back. Oh, all right. So, whoever has more than one sibling, you both do. You get to keep your money. Whoever comes to church at least two times a week, both of you, you're here all the time, you get to keep your money. Whoever uh, pays attention during the sermon, kind of. no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> kind of. You're honest. I'll give you that. All right, last one. Whoever is over six foot tall? No. Give it back. You're so close. All right. Was I fair? You didn't hit all the things. What if at this point I said I was fair, but at some point Lizzie might be six foot tall. I don't, Paul's really tall. She has a chance. I'm going to let Lizzie keep hers and not Leia because she might be six foot tall someday. What happened? That's, what? Not fair. That's not fair. I can't claim to be fair and give her the money even though she didn't hit all of the things that I said. Right? This game is now not fair. But you never know. I all right. Give money back. <laughs> you don't know. Are either of you six foot tall? No, I have siblings. That's true. Your dad and, and your Uncle John maybe get you. Okay, you guys can sit down. Thank you for standing. I appreciate your help. You, you can even applaud for them. All right, we don't like it when things are unfair, right, kids? You want everything to be fair, unless it's more fair to you, right? Does everybody, nobody's upset when they're too fair with you. Does that make sense? If you're the person with the 10 goldfish, that's no big deal. At this uh, story that we're going to tell this morning is, is continuing the idea of God being with us. And the second half of that is God with us to save us. But there's a big problem with this story. If God is to give you a pass for your sins, He is very quickly shown to not be fair. The Bible uses a different word. It calls it just. It would be the idea of Lizzie getting the money back even though she's not six foot tall. Yeah, Elias, you have a question? We'll come back to that later. All right, sounds good. This is a big problem. Kids, are you paying attention? Yep. Yep, all right. It's a big problem. God cannot just forgive your sins and be fair. He would be changing the rules. The Bible tells you that sin equals death, and you can't just change those rules. He would no longer be fair. And the Bible says all over the place that God is fair. It says that he's, he's just and he loves justice and mercy. He, he can't just be someone who changes the rules on us. You see in Romans chapter 3, which is where we're going to be this morning. You don't have to go there yet. Oh, now nah, we'll get to that one in just a second. Verse 20 says, For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Kids, you with me? If you just pay attention to the law, if it's fair and we follow the rules, no one can be saved. No one. Nobody gets the money if we follow the rules. Everybody comes up short. But God has a big problem. He says that He's going to pass over your sins. So how can God be fair and forgive? He answers that question later in that chapter. Now you can click on that one for me, Heidi. I paraphrase the verses for you. You remember our phrase, what is it? God with us to save us. Here's what he says later in that chapter. 
God put Jesus forward to turn his wrath away from us and instead towards Jesus so God can be fair and forgive. The reason that Jesus came at Christmas time is so that we could be saved and that God could remain fair while forgiving sins. God still follows the rules. He, he does punish the wrongdoing. He just punishes Jesus instead of you. God comes to be with us to save us. There's no other option. By the law, you can't do it on your own. God came to the earth as Jesus so that people could be righteous apart from the law. So that you could be saved even though it wouldn't be fair if you tried just by the law on its own. This way, the wrath that you deserve is given to Christ. This way, God is at the same time fair and forgiving. Or, as the language uses in Romans 3, He is just and the justifier. God with us to save us. One more time, kids. Say it. God with us to save us. Okay, you guys did all right today. We'll see if you remember next week. God came so that the game could be fair. He would still punish wrongdoing, but Christ stepped in and took that punishment for you. God with us to save us. All right, kiddos, you are dismissed. Who's teaching today? Lauren and Bree and Jill and the Berkey host. Every, all right, everyone... If you're a kiddo who's normally in class at this time, you can go ahead and head to the back. That's you, Elias, Levi, Junior, Harley. It is, it is bright in here today. I, just, I appreciate that. Okay, for those of you who are remaining, the adults and older kids who stay with us every Sunday, we're going to look at this same chapter, Romans chapter 3, really specifically verse 26, and this idea of God being with us, right? Last week was the story of the Exodus. God says to Moses, I will be with you. And then again, when he comes as Christ, he's named Emmanuel to remind us that God is with us. But there's not just a relational component of God being close. There is an intention with His closeness. He is with us to save us. We'll look at Romans chapter 3 in just a moment. Why don't we pray before we get there? Father, we ask that we would find our flesh giving way to Your Spirit this morning that we would be in awe of what happens at the cross, that you would come to be with us, to save us from our brokenness. Would you melt away our stubbornness, Lord? Would you please work in our hearts to guide us towards you, to re remind us of the great purpose and value that we see in Advent and the coming of your Son. Lord, we pray for guidance as a church this afternoon as we think about our future. Please give us wisdom as a collective body. Please allow us to disagree well, to love each other in the midst of disagreement. And uh, we ask, Lord, that through it all, that your name would be elevated and glorified to the maximum in us, in our lives, and in our church. We love you, Lord. Amen. This chapter of Romans chapter 3, if you have a Bible, you can go ahead and turn there. If you don't have a Bible, you can use one from the chairs in front of you. Um, if you're using one of those, we're going to be on page 940 this morning. But this chapter in Romans chapter 3 has, has been heaped with a lot of praise through the ages. It, it's been called the, the pinnacle of the Bible, the, 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 the summit of the whole Christian story, the, the most beautiful paragraph in the entire Bible, and that's... That is a, a tall order. And we're going to be looking 
primarily at verse 26 and a, a little bit more verse 25, but, but we need to make sure we don't miss the context a bit. So, if you jump back to verse 20, which I read out for the kids, for by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. That is a devastating verse. I, I, you, you're probably familiar enough with Romans, or you've just heard the, the conclusion there in verse 26 with the kids, to not feel the weight of the devastation that you probably should. By the law, no one, no human being will be justified in his sight. There is not a single possibility of anybody being made right before God through the law. Or to put that another way, the best humans that have ever lived, whoever comes to mind for you, that, that, that godly grandma who seems like she had a direct line to God, Saints that have come and gone, who have dedicated their lives, who have lived so upright and morally perfect, and, and the, the, the examples that we strive to be like, those people are not able to find good standing with God through the law. They are not good enough fall short of what is necessary to be in right relationship with the Creator. There is no human being who can be justified. How do we say this? What, how can I make a claim that there's nobody good enough? Well, I don't have to make it. Paul's already made it for me. If you look back, just at, probably a page to your left on chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Therefore, you have no excuse, O man... Every one of you judges for in passing judgment on one another. You condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? There, there's nobody who's exempt from this. You, oh man, the things that you hate that you see in other people, you know you do those, right? There have been lots of thinkers to try and articulate this point. Some of my favorite, Alexander Solonetskin said that, that the line between good and evil runs right through every person's heart. There's nobody who's just good. We, we all have good and evil. I believe it was C.S. Lewis who said, that there's nothing that I despise in someone else that is inherently absent from myself. Those, those things that just turn your stomach, the news stories that go, oh, that's gross, it's disgusting, it's repulsive. The selfishness, the, the pride, the, the anger, all of that's in you. You, you think you who judge other people, that's not something you do as well? You think you should be passed over for judgment? You definitely don't want them to be passed over for judgment, right? Those, those wicked people out there, the ever hypothetical them. But, well, but me, I, I mean, I'm different. I'm, I'm a good person. We judge ourselves by our intentions and others by their actions. And in reality, we are just as wicked as the most wicked people. There's nothing that you despise that is absent from you. So we are left in complete devastation. The wickedness of the world, all of it resides in my heart. But, it's a great linguistic turn, right? The, the but in verse 21 reverses everything that happened in verse 20. You all know this naturally. Anybody ever been in an argument? Anybody? 
you're talking with your spouse, I love the way you do dishes, but, <laughs> oh, okay, I, whatever's coming next just erased everything that you tried to cushion it at the beginning with, right? Whatever you attempted to just make it so soft and gentle, it's all gone. That's what happens in verse 21. It reverses all of the devastation of verse 20. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. What a glorious night indeed, you just sang. The righteousness of God has come. Not the righteousness afforded by the law. The righteousness given by God. It reverses the despair. It provides not just some hope, the greatest of hope, because it's not built on my ability to fulfill anything. It's built on God's gracious heart to give. And so the despair of verse 20 is righted in verse 20 and, uh, 21 and 22. However, this hopeful new situation comes with a problem. How can God, who is righteous, perfect, and just, just pass over sins? How can He still be just and just look over those things. Give righteousness to those who don't deserve it. This is the nature of the problem that we see here. God is with us to save us, but that becomes a problem. If God is going to look over our sins, then we have become a stain on His spotless record. He is no longer just. We normally like to think of the requirements that come along with being made right as being attached to the, the system that God set up, right? God created the world. God God's caused the price of sin to be death. God caused the only answer to be Him as a sacrifice. And there, usually this thought comes with some sort of an objection. If it was God's creation that he made entirely out of his desires, then why didn't he make a system that did not require that blood sacrifice to be made right? Why didn't he just do it a different way? We don't realize in that objection that the system that was created is not just an outworking of of God's design, it is also an outworking of God's character. You can see this from the very get-go with the creation story. After every single uh, section of, of the day of creation, God pauses to say what? It is good. Creation is good. And what does Jesus tell you in Mark chapter 10? There is no one good but God. But creation is literally formed in, in the same descriptive language as God is. It is modeled after His character, not just after His designs. But that truth rings true as well in the, uh, the nature and the story, not just of creation, but also of redemption. God is holy. To be in His presence, you must be holy. That is stated very clearly in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. There is a holiness without which no one will see the Lord. But God is also just. Deuteronomy 32, 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect. All His ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without injustice. Righteous and upright is He. So we have a problem. To be consistent with God's character, the world that He has created, He cannot just overlook the sins of His created order. 
He cannot just pass by. He can't allow people to be made right with him and still be consistent in his character. If you are unholy and you are made right with God, then God is not just. He is no longer what he claims to be. The game isn't fair. You must be holy to see God. He is just in all that He does. Therefore, all people must be dealt with justly. And if you are unholy, a just uh, verdict is to be separated from the holy God. It is the only possible conclusion in line with the character of God. It's, this is a big problem. And if you do not see it as a big problem, then you have one of two struggles at hand. First, you have not grappled fully with the weight of your sin. Or second, you have not grappled fully with the holiness of God. One of those two things is at play in your heart if you do not see this as an issue. We don't generally see it as an issue, right? There are very few people who wake up and go, man, the wrath of God has not been poured out on me today. I'm, I'm so shocked that, that the just God has not done what He should do to me. We either don't understand His holiness or we don't understand our sin. It is a crisis in the heavenly realm. God cannot be righteous and just forgive sins. It is a watershed moment for God. His very character is in jeopardy and it cannot be answered without the cross. The problem of redemption, of, of redeeming those to Him who are not worthy, of allowing unholy people to be made right, is solved in the cross. You see in verse 25, if you're in Romans chapter 3, because in His divine forbearance He had passed over sins. Past tense. Talking about, about Old Testament people here. He, he has passed over sins. Things that have happened have been forgiven. But God is just. He can't just do that. He's, he's no longer just if this is the case. These two things are incompatible. And again, it, it just for a moment, try to bring it home to you. If you have a child, you, you picture your child. If you don't have any children, find a niece or nephew. Or if you are a child, your sibling or, or your best friend, whoever it may be. Playing in the front yard. I live on a busy street. We're not out in the front yard very often, but every so often we have to go out there and the kids are with us and you're working on the yard and you, have, you, know, you have to stay here. And as your child, your niece, nephew, sibling, whatever it may be, is playing in the front yard, you hear a car come screeching down the road. Every parent's worst nightmare, is it not? Out of control. Jump that curb. And 2,000 pounds of metal connects with your child. As you stand there trying to hold your, your, your child who's dying, you see right, the person get out of the car, clearly drunk, and tries to stumble away. Can you imagine the heartbreak of losing your child to an accident like that? It makes your gut cringe a little bit just to think about it, does it not? Your grandchild, your sibling. Now imagine again that person who is the perpetrator of that crime is caught. You arrive at the sentencing here, Fort Wayne, Indiana. You go downtown. You stand in front of a judge. Judge Wendy Davis is down there. The perpetrator stands up and the judge says, you are uh, accused of driving drunk. Manslaughter, fleeing the scene of an accident. We're just going to let you go on this one. 
We're, we're going to let this one go. Can you feel the outrage? That, there's nothing just about that. This is contemptible. It's revolting. That judge would be thrown off the bench tomorrow. That is the accusation against the Almighty God. You are allowing the murderous, vile people of this world to get off the hook. And that's not even a, a hyperbolic uh, analogy there to use. These very situations happen. Probably one of the most notable ones is King David. You know the story of David and Bathsheba? David sees, he lusts, he takes, commits adultery. And then in an attempt to cover up his wickedness, he has eventually Bathsheba's husband Uriah killed. Listen to the words of King David in Psalm 103. He, that is God, does not deal with us according to our sins. He does not repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His steadfast love towards those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does He remove our transgressions from us. Now can you imagine being Uriah's parents and reading the Psalm of David? How dare you, God? How can you possibly remove that man's transgressions from him? He is a murderer. And you are just going to forgive? This is not a just God. This is a crisis for the character of God. And there is a proper accusation levied against the Almighty that He is not just if this is the case. But, once again, but, the nature of the problem takes us to the nature of the solution. But, verse 25, God puts Christ forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He had passed over former sins. It was to show His righteousness at the present time so that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. There is a lot there. It is one of the most glorious few sentences in all of human history. Let's just start at the very beginning. Whom God put forward. This is not a small deal. God intentionally puts Christ forward. This wasn't an accident of circumstances. The incarnation that we celebrate at Christmas time, God becoming flesh, is done with the cross in mind. It's done, as Ephesians 1 tells us, before the foundations of the world were laid. That God has planned to, to take on your sins in Christ Jesus. This is no accident. This is God becoming flesh to save us. He takes on flesh to arrive at the cross. Not a random accident of overzealous Roman officials. It was the intention of God to lead him to die. God put him forward. So that's the first thing. The next, put him forward as a propitiation. This is a good old Bible word. If you haven't been in church a while and this one is new to you, that's okay. Learn a new word today. It's a good day. Propitiation. Not used in 
common language much anymore. But it essentially means the turning away of wrath. The, the righteous anger of God is turned away. He put Christ forward as our propitiation, the one who turns the wrath of God. The just punishment that we deserve is turned away from us. You can only be forgiven of your shortcomings your lapses in judgment, your lifetime of sin because Christ was punished for you. Don't try to sanitize the gospel message. This is meant to be shocking and offensive. The language of the songs we sing, sometimes it shocks you, right? There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. That's almost barbaric. It's meant to be. The wrath of God is poured out. It is not a pretty sight. Do you remember the first time you saw the passion of the Christ? We've all heard that, that story told, but to be confronted with it in such a, a painful visual way, do you remember how difficult that was to look in the face? God poured His wrath out on Christ instead of you. And here we find the great purpose of God becoming flesh in Jesus. Through Christ, He saves us while preserving the holiness and justice of God. The cross does not find a middle ground of a road of compromise by changing the rules to a fair game to allow someone who should lose to win. The cross does not cheapen the character of God to allow what is impure to be overlooked. God's wrath is on full display as well as His mercy. We have in the person of Christ at the cross the holiness of God and the justice of God turned up to 11, right? It, it is as loud as it can go. Ours go to 11. Sorry, that's a... Never mind. Not the time. Spinal tap. I don't, it just came out. Proper punishment is given. Someone is punished for the crime. And at the same time, forgiveness is offered. Because God became flesh in Christ to die for us. It is at the cross that God is both perfectly wrathful and perfectly loving. It is at the cross that He is perfectly holy and perfectly just. It is at the cross that He is perfectly fair and perfectly forgiving. You see the language that Paul uses because in His divine forbearance He passed over former sins. It was to show His righteousness at the present time so that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. This isn't just a crisis of appearance, by the way. He actually is accused of not being just, not just not appearing. He needs to be just. And in Christ at the cross, a bright spotlight is shown on the character of God, beckoning all who come and behold their great, merciful, and just Creator to turn away from their resting in their own abilities and instead find acceptance in Christ. To find righteousness that is not your own. All while maintaining His holiness and His justice. It is the beauty of the cross. 
It is why we celebrate Advent. God with us to save us so that God can be, be just and the justifier of those who are in Christ Jesus. One commentator said it this way. So the cross is the place where the judge takes the judgment. This was the Father's plan, and it was also the Son's willing sacrifice. He did not suffer because He had to, but because He loved His Father and us. He could have turned aside, but chose not to. God does not set His justice aside. He turns it onto Himself. What a mind-blowing truth! God came to be with us to, to die so that God could be perfectly wrathful, just, and at the same time pass over your sins, forgive you of the grave offenses that you have routinely committed. And we find in Advent, this season of anticipation of God becoming flesh and the person of Christ Jesus, we find in Advent the long shadow of the cross leading to its God-designed conclusion, just and the justifier. God putting Christ forward begins at the Incarnation. Next week, we are going to look at a proper response to that truth. For this week, I always try to have some kind of application. If you are a believer, if you are someone who is described here, one whose wrath that God had designated for you has instead been turned and poured out on Christ, if that marks your life, the application is quite clear. Revel in this truth. Bask in the glorious beauty of what Christ has done for you. When God sees you, He doesn't see that vile sinner, the, the drunk who hopped the curb. He doesn't see the, the angry, selfish person that you are. He sees the righteousness of Christ. He sees God with us to save us. He sees you now as more precious than all of His creation. Bask in the greatness of Christ coming to be with us to die for us. If you are not a believer, if you are not someone who has ever had that life-changing, wrath-altering Belief in Christ. The application is also quite clear. Turn to Him. You can not by the law be made righteous. You can't fix your brokenness by the law. You have no hope. And God is a righteous, just God. That wrath will be poured out. Sin must be punished. It's either going to be punished on you or it has been punished on Christ. If you are not a believer today, the call is quite clear. Receive by faith what has been done for you. You can have your heart turned as the book of Romans has done so many times for so many people. That realization, oh my, I am helpless without God. I, I have no chance. All I can do is fall on Him, fall on what Christ has done for me. Trust that, that He is sufficient to cover my brokenness as magnificent as my brokenness is. You are more sinful than you can possibly imagine, than even you understand. And at the same time, Christ is better and able to forgive. And you are invited today to receive that truth by faith. That God will save you, even though you don't deserve it. 
even when you were wicked and vile. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that if your spirit is turning in anyone's heart towards that end today, we ask that that you would change them. That they would, as, as your text, the Bible tells us, repent and believe. Admit to the sin that has plagued them and place their faith in you, Lord. Would you turn hearts? For those of us, Lord, who have had our hearts turned towards you, we praise you for you are worthy of praise. What a great, amazing truth as a church to be built upon. That you are perfect, holy, and just. And at the same time, you've forgiven us, Lord. Would you help us to find new ways to bask in the greatness of that truth? Please guide our church, Lord. Remind us of the greatness that we stand on. We pray in your Son's name. Amen.